Hello, I'm Dr Octavia Cox and welcome to my channel where I do all things classic literature. Today in this video I'm going to provide an introduction to poetic metre and rhythm. I think sometimes students or those who don't have a background or training in um, literary terminology can find the idea of poetic metre a bit scary and therefore off-putting. But it isn't scary once you know how, and like anything really, it's much easier when you know where to begin. So today I want to break down the terminology of poetical metre and rhythm and explain the foundational, basic, compositional elements, the, the building blocks really, of poetic metre and rhythm in clear and straightforward, I hope, terms. So I'm going to provide definitions and also go through some examples of different poetic meters. So by the end of the video, I hope you will feel confident enough to tackle determining any poetic meter and rhythm that you come across in any poem in the future. Meter derives from the classical Greek for measure, hence why we also measure distance in meters. So how do we measure the rhythms of poetry. The predominant English verse form uh, in the literary tradition since the Middle Ages, since, since Chaucer really, is accentual syllabic metre. And as the name suggests, this pattern of rhythm consists of a regular number of accented, that is stressed, syllables arranged within a fixed total number of syllables in the line. So we identify or classify poetic rhythm in terms of accent and number of syllables. One of the most common verse forms that you may well have come across is iambic pentameter, for example. So iambic concerns the accent or stress within the rhythm and pentameter is to do with the overall number number of syllables in the line and how they are divided. Don't worry, I'm going to go through how it all breaks down a bit later. But as well as iambic pentameter, you can have, for example, trochaic trimeter or dactylic tetrameter. Um, but these are all composed in a similar way to iambic pentameter in terms of working out the classification. So I'm going to break down that classification. But the point for now is that when you are looking at determining poetic meter and rhythm, you are looking for two things. So first, you are looking for the accents in the line, iambic. And second, the overall number of syllables in the line and how they are kind of divided within the line, pentameter. And that is accentual syllabic meter, which is the, how we kind of determine uh, how we measure meter and rhythm in English verse form. How do you determine poetic meter and rhythm? We're going to start with the second half of the accentual syllabic categorization. So we're going to start with syllabic. The very first thing you should do is to work out the number of syllables in the line overall. So for example, what are the number of syllables in these two lines? So first, is a line by Thomas Hardy, it's from The Voice from uh, 1912, and the line is, woman much missed how you call to me, call to me. And another example is from Alexander Pope from an essay on criticism, 1711, that like a wounded snake drags its slow length along. How many syllables are there in those two lines? Well, Woman much missed how you call to me, call to me. 12. And Pope, that like a wounded snake drags its slow length along. So both have 12 syllables in the, own, in the line overall, but they are not the same in terms of rhythm, in terms of the syllabic 
categorization that we're looking for because they have different metrical feet. So what are metrical feet? Well, you can think of metrical feet as being a bit like beats in a bar in music notation. So you can have, for example, four beats in a bar. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. And that would be four beats in a bar. But you can also have three beats in a bar. So something like a waltz, for example, which is one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three. Now those are both bars, but they have different numbers of beats within them. So likewise, metrical feet can be made up of different numbers of syllables or beats within one metrical foot. The most common form of metrical foot in English poetry is called duple meter, which is disyllabic, meaning that it is composed of two syllables or beats in each metrical foot. So going back to our examples from earlier then, if we look at the Pope, that like a wound did snake drags its slow length along. So this is in duple meter. It's got two syllables in each metrical foot that like a wounded snake drags its slow length along. Note, however, that the metrical feet can divide words. So the word wounded here is uh, divided between different metrical feet. And that's fine. Now, we also have, although it's much rarer in English poetry, is triple meter. This is trisyllabic, which means that it has three syllables or three beats in each metrical foot. So to go to our other example, the Hardy example, we have woman much missed how you call to me, call to me. So you can see that there are three syllables there in each metrical foot. The rhythm is uh, trisyllabic. So even though both of those examples have 12 syllables overall, you can see that they are divided differently. The Pope is in duple meter and Hardy is in triple meter. So once you have worked out the rhythm of the metrical feet, then you can determine how many metrical feet there are in the overall line. These are called monometer that is one metrical foot, dimeter, that is two metrical feet, trimeter, that is three metrical feet, tetrameter, four metrical feet, pentameter, five metrical feet, hexameter, six metrical feet, heptameter, seven metrical feet, octameter, eight metrical feet, uh, and so on. Uh, it, can, it kind of can go on indefinitely, but it's unlikely that you would meet anything really more than more than that. And how do these combine with duple meter and trimeter? Well, let's take dimeter, for example. So in duple meter, a line of dimeter is four beats or syllables in the overall line. So duple meter is two per metrical foot. Dimeter is two metrical feet in the whole line. So you have four beats, four syllables overall. In triple meter, in a line of dimeter, that is six beats or syllables in the overall line because triple meter is where you have three syllables in each metrical foot, dimeter, two metrical feet. So overall, you have six syllables in the overall line and they are both dimeter even though there is a different number of syllables in the line overall. So duple meter and triple meter can both be in dimeter and that will mean that there are different, they are different lengths overall and a different rhythm overall. So another example, let's take trimeter. So in duple meter, uh, trimeter, consists of six beats or syllables in the line overall, and in triple meter, that is nine B, 
beats or syllables in the overall line for the same reasons uh, that I was explaining with dimeter. Okay, so returning to our examples then, let's start with Pope. So, that like a wounded snake drags its slow length along, there are 12 syllables in the overall line and they are in duple meter. So 12 syllables divided by two duple meter, that makes six metrical feet. So this is a line of hexameter, duple meter hexameter. And let's take our other example from Hardy. So, woman, much missed how you call to me, call to me. 12 syllables in the line, but it's in triple meter. So, 12 syllables overall divided by three triple meter, that makes four. So, there are four metrical feet in this line. It is a line of tetrameter. So, triple meter tetrameter. So, even though both of these lines have the same number of syllables overall, 12, they have different metrical feet and hence a different rhythm and meter. Now we come on to the first half of the classification, so accentual. That is to do then with the stresses. So where do the stresses lie in the line? Where is the emphasis placed by the rhythm? Starting with duple meter, we remember that that is disyllabic meter. So Kind of logically, there are only four options. And these are called iams or iambic meter, troches or trochaic meter, spondees or spondaic meter, and pyrrhic meter. The most commonly uh, used and known is an iam, so iambic meter. This is where you have a metrical foot of two syllables, which is unstressed and then stressed. So, didum, 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 didum. A classic example is John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost. And this is the very opening of the poem. Now I'm going to read it iambically and I'm going to really stress it. So it's going to sound a little bit weird, but I want you to have a sense of, uh, I really want to emphasise where the emphasis is placed. Of course, you wouldn't actually read it this strongly. But of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. That's iambic pentameter. So... It's iambic because in the feet we have unaccented and then accented. And it's pentameter because there are 10 syllables in the line. It's in duple meter, so each metrical foot has two syllables, it's disyllabic. So that means overall there are five metrical feet, which means it is pentameter. So in line three, particularly, all the important words are emphasis, emphasised by the iambic rhythm. So, brought death into the world and all our woe. We can really see why the emphasis is iambic in this line, because the stress then falls on death, world, all, woe. So we're really, uh, the rhythm there is encouraging us to uh, stress the important words in that line. In other lines, the emphasis is less strong. So it's not particularly iambic, but still that's the sort of underlying or basic rhythm that the poem kind of returns to. And you can see it brought out, as I've said, in some lines like brought death into the world and all our woe, where it's particularly strong um, and it sort of fades out in others. And because iambic pentameter is, is really the most prevalent metrical rhythm in English poetry. Uh, here is another example, um, this time by John Dryden. So this is his poem, The Hind and the Panther, which is from 1687. A milk white hind, immortal and unchanged, fed on the lawns and in the forest ranged, without unspotted, innocent within, she feared 
no danger for she knew no sin. Yet had she oft been chased with horns and hounds and Scythian shafts and many winged wounds aimed at her heart was often forced to fly and doomed to death though fated not to die. So this, as with Paradise Lost, is in iambic pentameter, but you will notice that the rhythm is far, far more pronounced in some lines than in others. The iambic meter is particularly strong, for example, in lines four and eight. This is the end of each quatrain. So each quatrain is finishing on a very strongly iambic uh, rhythm. She feared no danger for she knew no sin. The important kind of words here are emphasised feared, the beginning of danger, knew sin. Uh, and the same is true of line eight, so the end of the second quatrain, doomed to death, though fated not to die. Um, but Dryden elsewhere uses different kinds of emphasis. So here in the third line, for example, he uses chiastic antithesis and caesura. Caesura is a pause in the middle of the line. So he produces emphasis differently in the way that he has formed that line. He doesn't do it through metrical rhythm, through the iambic pentameter in line three in the way that he does in line four. So in line three, I said, I said it's chiastic antithesis. So we have kind of without and within at the ends of the line and then unspotted and innocent in the middle of the line. So you have this kind of balanced line with a pause in the middle so that the kind of without and within, um, they encompass or they surround the unspotted innocence within. So it's a different way of forming the line. And the reason why I bring this up is because the metrical rhythm is not always the way that a line emphasises. <laughs> what is important within that line and actually probably it's a sign of a good poet and a good poem if they vary how they create emphasis and how they expect the reader to um, to vary the emphasis that they place in the line so that it isn't exactly the same all the way through the poem because actually a Probably it's going to be a bad poem that has a, an entirely regular, entirely uniform rhythm meter within it because it just sat, begins to sound very tiring after a while. So if you just have a poem in full iambic pentameter, so da dum 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 gets very tiring, very repetitive after a while, and almost sort of lulls you to sleep basically because um because there's no variation because there's no change in emphasis. So when you're trying to work out the rhythm or the meter in the poem, often what you have to pay attention to actually is the deviation from the rhythm. So you, you look for the kind of general overall pattern, generally speaking, this is in iambic pentameter, but here it breaks, here it breaks, here it breaks. Why is it broken in those particular bits? Um, so that's just another thing to, to think about when you're, when you're working out the rhythm and meter within a poem. Another classification is the troche or trochaic meter. And this is the opposite of an iam. So an iam that we just looked at is unstressed stress. So did um. A troche, the opposite, is stress and then unstress. So dum de 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 so you have the emphasis at the beginning of the metrical foot a classic example is the witch's repeated spell chant from william shakespeare's macbeth so double double toil and trouble fire burn and cauldron bubble that is trochaic so it's got the emphasis at the beginning of each metrical foot and it's tetrameter. It's tetrameter because there are eight syllables in the line, double, 
double toil and trouble. So there are eight syllables in the line. It's in duple meter, so it's disyllabic. So eight divided by two, four, four metrical feet. So it is tetrameter. And it's trochaic, as I've said, because in each foot it is stressed and then unstressed. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron, bubble. So at the beginning of each of those metrical feet uh, is emphasised. And in this case also um, words, the beginning of the words, although that is not necessarily always the case. So moving on then to our other, other uh, categories. So the spondy and pyrrhic metre. So spondy or spondaic metre. This is when both uh, syllables in a disyllabic metrical foot are emphasised. So dumb, dumb. And the opposite of that is pyrrhic. So when, when neither is stressed, when they're both unstressed. So D, D. Now the last two... Uh, are used comparatively for emphasis because stressed and unstressed are relative terms. In order to have a stress, you have to have surrounding unstressed syllables. You cannot have a, an entirely spondaic rhythm because every syllable would then be stressed. And because every syllable is stressed, none is really stressed. <laughs> so if you try and emphasise every syllable, then they all become equally as stressed or unstressed as the other. So it, it, you, you kind of logically cannot have an entire poem that is spondaic or pyrrhic. They are uh, terms used to describe um, kind of changes in emphasis. I mean, you can have an entirely iambic poem you can have an entirely trochaic poem as I've said they would get hourly a bit tiring because interest is often generated through deviation from the expected rhythm you will find spondaic or pyrrhic feet in amongst otherwise iambic or trochaic meter you won't find an entirely spondaic or entirely pyrrhic poem a really crucial point that I want you to take away from this lecture today is that all good poetry, obviously generally speaking, but it, it's really almost universally true that all good poetry does not have a completely regular rhythm and meter all the way through the entire poem. Because if it did, it would become hourly tiring. It doesn't keep you on your toes at all if the emphasis is the same rhythmically all the way through. Instead, a good poet will often mix up metrical stresses in order to emphasise different parts of the line, in order to keep that aural interest. And often when you're analysing a poem, when you come to it, it's, it's at that break in rhythm that, or so, you know, it's sort of something changes, it's different for some reason, and that's probably the bit that you want to pay attention to. That's probably the bit that the author is trying to hourly draw your attention to the fact that something has changed or that something is slightly uneasy or that there's a sense that for some reason you should be drawn to that line. Returning again to my beloved <laughs> Alexander Pope, um, you can read the kind of example line iambically. So you can read it as that like a wounded snake drags its slow length along. You can read it like that iambically, but it makes more sense, I think, to articulate this line with a mixture of rhythms. That is different stresses within each metrical foot. So I would read the first half of the line iambically. So this is the line um, that is sort of relating to the to the simile that like a wound did snake. But the second half of the line after the caesura, after the pause, I think it changes. So I think drags it's, I think it's the drags that is emphasised. So I would say that that was a trophy. And then the slow and the length, I think, are also emphasised, which makes that metrical foot a spondy. And then I think the line closes again with 
a long. I think the, the long part of that is emphasized. So back to I am. This line of popes is a metatextual joke about bad poetry. So a line of bad poetry is like a wounded snake uh, in the, the comparative parts, as I said, the, the, the simile at the beginning of the line, the rhythm I would say is iambic, so that you're kind of gearing up to actually what the simile is going to kind of describe the comparison it's going to make. And in the half of the line that describes that, that makes that comparison, that describes how a line of bad poetry is uh, like a dying snake, how they are similar, they both drag their slow lengths along. The rhythm breaks from the expected iambic rhythm into a mixture of stresses, I think. So the iambic emphasis on snake, followed immediately by the trachaic emphasis on drags, makes the pause between them stronger. That like a wounded snake, drags its slow length along. You have to pause between them. So the caesura of the pause is kind of emphasized further because you have these two emphasized um, syllables sort of right next to each other, which is breaking with the expected iambic rhythm. So you don't expect the drags to be emphasized because the beginning of the line has got you used to iambic rhythm. So the pause is made stronger and it disrupts, as I've said, the established iambic rhythm in order to draw attention to the dragging. So to draw attention to the comparison. And the spondaic slow length does literally drag out the rhythm of the line. So it's a kind of beautiful um, way in which the form informs the meaning of the line because kind of literally the slow length, having both of those emphasized in that spondy, does literally drag out the line. That was duple meter. So now let us consider accents in triple meter. That is trisyllabic feet. So uh, metrical feet that have three syllables, three beats in each foot. And I'm going to run through these quite quickly because they're much less common because triple meter itself is much less common. But the most common forms uh, in trisyllabic meter are anapasts, so anapiastic meter and dactyls, which is dactylic meter. In all likelihood, it's probably those two that you are going to come across um, in poetry, but I will run through the others um, as well. But you can think in some ways of an anapast as being a bit like an I am in that the final element of the metrical foot is stressed. So in an I am, it's did dum and in an anapast, it's diddy dum diddy dum diddy dum diddy dum diddy dum So here is an example of some lines uh, in anapiastic meter. Uh, these are from Lord Byron, and this is the poem, The Destruction of Sennacherib. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea, when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. Like the leaves of the forest when summer is green, like the leaves of the forest when autumn hath blown, for the angel of death spreads his wings on the blast, and the eyes of the sleepers wax deadly and chill, and their hearts at once heaved and forever grew still. Okay, so that is anapiastic tetrameter. How do we know it's tetrameter? Well, there are 12 syllables in the line, so the uh, for the angel of death spread his wings on the blast. So there are 12 syllables. It's uh, trisyllabic feet. So there are three syllables in each metrical foot because it's an anapast. So 12 divided by three, four. So it's tetrameter, I, uh, anapiastic tetrameter. Okay, so the opposite of uh, anapiastic meter is, uh, and this is, we can think of this a bit like a troche, so troches, as I said, where, where, where the emphasis is on the beginning of each metrical foot, so dum d, and a dactyl is dum d d, dum d d, dum d d, dum d d. So stressed, unstressed, unstressed. So back to our earlier hardy example 
right back from the beginning. This is the voice. Woman much missed how you call to me, call to me. You can see that the emphasis is on the first part of each metrical foot. Um, so this is dactylic tetrameter. The lines of Byron's and Hardy's are similar in that they are both trisyllabic tetrameters, but the stress, the accent, the emphasis is different in each. So Byron's was anapiastic tetrameter, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, whereas Hardy's was dactylic tetrameter. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And here are some much rarer forms. So we might think of the tribrach as being a bit like a pyrrhic meter. So tribrachic meter is where all three parts of the metrical foot are unstressed. And the opposite of that, a bit like a spondy, is where all of the beats in the metrical foot are stressed. And that uh, in trisyllabic meter is called molossus or melossic meter. So stressed, stressed, stressed. So as with pyrrhic and spondaic metrical feet, tribrachic and uh, melossic metrical feet are usually used sporadically and for a particular kind of moment of emphasis. We then move on to amphibrach or amphibrachic meter. So this is the classical Greek for short at both ends. So this is unstressed, stressed, unstressed. Did dum d did dum d did dum d did dum d. And the opposite of that is the amphimesa or amphimachic meter, which is the classical Greek for long at both ends. So stressed, unstressed, stressed. So dum did dum dum did dum dum did dum dum did dum. Finally, we have a uh, bacchus or bacchic meter, so unstressed, stressed, stressed, and the opposite, uh, anti bacchus or anti bacchic meter, which is stressed, stressed, unstressed. Okay, so let's have some examples then. See if you can work out these accentual syllabic meters uh, for yourself. So first, what do you think this is in terms of the overall meter? This is um, William Wordsworth's Anecdote for Fathers, which was first published in the Local Ballads from 1798. I have a boy of five years old. His face is fair and fresh to see. His limbs are cast in beauty's mould and dearly he loves me. What we have here is duple meter. So it's disyllabic. I have a boy of five years old. And the iambic meter, I think here, is, is really strong. So the opening three lines are iambic tetrameter, and the final line, contrastingly, is iambic trimeter. So there are eight syllables overall in the first three lines, but only six in the final line of the stanza. Many, many uh, stanzas in English literature are composed in this way, especially ballad quatrains. Um, in taking a metrical foot off the final line in a stanza and having it be one metrical foot shorter because it creates a pause at the end of the stanza as here. So I have a boy of five years old, his face is fair and fresh to see, his limbs are cast in beauty's mould and dearly he loves me. So you have that kind of concluding pause at the end of this uh, kind of strongly rhythmical, strongly rhyming uh, quatrain ballad. This is another example. This is Alfred Lord Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade from 1854. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell rode the 600. So what do you think is the meter, is the rhythm in the Charge of the Light Brigade. Okay, so I think that this is dactylic 
die meter apart from the very final line which is debatable i think but the the majority of the stanza is dactylic diameter. So it's dactylic because it's stressed, unstressed, unstressed. So canon to right of them, canon to left of them, canon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shot and so on. So the emphasis is at the beginning of each metrical foot. So it's dactylic and it's diameter. Uh, because there are six syllables per line so into the jaws of death so there are six syllables per line each metrical foot is trisyllabic so it's got three beats in it so six in the overall line divided by three because it's in triple meter so it's trisyllabic which makes two metrical feet per line which makes it diameter so dactylic diameter for the vast majority of the stanza but I read the final line of the stanza as trachaic and anti bacchic meter although you might well interpret the, the emphasis differently. Let me read it through again and then we can see how the final line sort of breaks up the established rhythm. So the vast majority of the stanza is very clearly emphasised Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the 600. So it's got a different number of syllables in the overall line and the emphasis, the stress is clearly different. And so I think that it's trachaic because it's rode the... 600. So I interpret it that way, but you might interpret that final line differently. But the, the point is that the rhythm changes. However it is that you read it, the rhythm changes. It is unsettled in the final line. And this shows the kind of unease or the upset or that something is not quite right with these 600 riding in to this, um, well, to, you know, to the valley of death. It's, it's um, that the rhythm is making it clear that something is off, that something isn't quite right, that something probably is going to go wrong for this 600. Um, and that, again, it's form informing meaning because the rhythm is unsettling and we're kind of lulled into a false sense of security by the very, uh, repetitive, strongly emphasised uh, dactylic diameter of the first part of the stanza and that's then kind of whipped away from us because the rhythm changes in that final line and it's not actually quite clear how, how it's supposed to be emphasised and where the pause is kind of supposed to be because it seems that it's supposed to be at the very beginning of the line where the emphasis has previously been. I'm going to close on a final example, it's more Tennyson, this time the poem break 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 and i warn you it's a, it's a bit of a bit of a tricky one so how do you interpret the rhythm of these lines and just to uh, reiterate yes you can look at the rhythm in an if you're analyzing a poem you can look at the overall rhythm in a verse paragraph or in a stanza or so on but also you can break it down into individual metrical feet to see how the um, author uses emphasis if you're if you're doing an analysis for a poem or an essay on a poem or something like that so this is tennyson's break 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 at thy foot of thy crags o c so how would you kind of describe the makeup of the meter and rhythm here in this poem so i would say that the first line is molossus so break 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 and there aren't many examples in english literature but i managed to find managed to find one at thy foot of thy crags so i think that those are um anapasts so that the final part of each metrical foot is emphasized and then i think o c both of those are also emphasized so i think that that is a spondy but it is up for debate and this is one of the things that 
I hope that you take away from this video today, or if you're doing analysis um, of poetry more generally, is that these things are not set in stone. There is room for variation in where you place the emphasis, you know, within a line or within a metrical foot. So if you're coming to a poem and you're a bit worried because you think, oh, I'm not, sh I'm not quite sure about where the emphasis is placed here, that's, that's okay. It could be, you can choose. It could, you might read it one time and put it one place. You might read it another time and think, oh, actually it isn't an I am, it's a trochee. That's, that's okay. <laughs> that, that's fine. There's room for variation. There's room for change. If you're, you know, a student and you're writing an essay and you're analysing a poem, then again, you can disagree with somebody who might say this is an I am and you think it's a trochee. That's okay. But in your analysis, you want to think about why you think it's important that the emphasis is placed at the beginning of a metrical foot rather than on the second, you know, in a, in a, in a duple meter metrical foot anyway, why it's um, on the second half. So as with my example with Alexander Pope earlier, you know, there's room for movement. You can read it entirely iambically if you want to, but if, if you think actually there's more going on with the rhythm, um, and the emphasis is a bit more complicated, then you might want to think about why it's more complicated um, in those parts where you think the, there is a deviation in the expected rhythm. And that's what I want to kind of close by really emphasizing and reiterating is that the most, generally speaking, the aural interest in a poem and aural meaning, you know, pertaining to the ear and to the hearing, that often that the aural interest comes or the highest moments of interest comes come in those moments of deviation from the expected rhythm so paying attention to the the places where the rhythm doesn't seem to quite fit is just as important as working out the kind of general established rhythm because it's in those deviations perhaps that the author has placed uh, greater meaning. Thank you very much indeed for watching. I do hope that you found this introduction to poetic meter and rhythm illuminating and uh, useful and interesting. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel where I analyse classic literature, then do subscribe. And if you have liked the video, then do please press the thumbs up button. It helps me out in YouTube's algorithm. And do you have any of your own particularly kind of striking and interesting examples of poetic meter? If so, then do please leave them in the comments below.